Good morning. Thanks for coming early. It's 8.40 now. It's, it's earlier than probably most of you were expecting to be here. At least for me. Um, anyway, um, so today we're going to try to fly through a bunch of material about rasters. Um, so I want to just quickly start. How many of you have taken a GIS class before at some point? Okay. How many of you have worked with a raster data set before? Either in that GIS class or something else. Okay. So um, for those of you who have taken a class before, you've probably seen a lot of this stuff. So we're just going to quickly go through what a raster is, how it's stored, how it's formatted, the different um, ways we can work with them. And then we're going to dive into some remote sensing applications and other um, other kind of modern techniques for working with these tools in the kind of environment we're working with here. Um, so to start, first things first, let us uh, I posted a link on the Slack channel, on the general channel. Hopefully you guys can all grab that. It's the repo location. So hopefully you've all got your Jupyter Hub spun up or Jupyter Lab spun up. And we're going to go here and we're going to open a new terminal. So you can do that. I clicked this plus button up here. Um, and this is the way I, didn't, I, I wasn't around. I hope, did you cover this yesterday, Lindsay, about this interface and how to start? Okay, cool. So start a new terminal and go somewhere, wherever you're keeping material for this week. So maybe you created a separate directory in your home directory. Um, in this case, we can just clone it directly into our home directory. It, it's temporary, you don't have to store it forever. So uh, we're gonna do git clone. And I just pasted in that link there. Okay. And so we do that. It's going to take a minute to grab all the material. And if all went well, yeah. Yeah. Okay, uh, so I'm going to keep a beat on this. Okay, if you're if you're having trouble getting this Pangeo instance spun up, put your sticky note up and someone will come around and give you a hand, get you up to speed. Okay, everyone's trying to watch it at the same time. Yeah. Okay, um, so assuming that that worked for you, um, running that git clone, you should now have a raster 2019 directory wherever you just pulled that down. So that could be, in, in this case, it's just the, the home directory here. So if we, in this file browser, so to get to that, you can click this folder icon up here. If we double click in here, it'll bring us into this, this repository. And we see there's a directory in here called notebooks. And there's eight notebooks in here. So we have to get through this in the next hour and a half. <laughs> Right, we'll see. We'll see how it goes. I'm going to try and move quickly through the introduction and then Scott's going to get into some examples using 
X-ray and some different remote sensing data sets. Uh, I think that's really going to be the most relevant part for most of you, given some of the project ideas that came up yesterday. All right, so if we double click on the first one, zero, we can get started here. Okay, so this is material that we've kind of compiled together from previous years of GeoHack Week. I attempted to update it this morning. Um, it's, a, it's a working uh, working document, a living document, we'll say that. Um, so today we're gonna talk about raster and vector data. These are kind of the two fundamental formats that we use in GIS and geospatial analysis. So I won't get into the vector data because we're gonna talk about that later this afternoon or this morning. Um, but really that's, that's like distinct features like points, lines, or polygons um, that have a bunch of attributes. Um, whereas a raster data is kind of a fixed grid. It's a two dimensional grid of values that are rendered on the map as pixels. And each, each value has a specific geographic location. Um, so at its core, it's just a, an array of pixels. Hopefully you've all worked with an array, a two dimensional object with rows and columns. Um, and it can contain continuous values like a DEM, like elevation data, um, or it can be categorical like land cover classes. So coniferous forests versus bare ground versus ice or something like that. Um, so you've all worked with these. You, you may not have encountered one in a GIS context, but you've all seen a digital image. You've taken a digital photograph. That's a raster data set. The difference here is we're assigning metadata to give it some geospatial information. So we know where that two dimensional image lives in some world coordinate system. Okay. Um, so this is an example here. This is a RGB image, a red, green, blue image. You can see there's a lot of trees here that are green. And they've pulled out a little section here to illustrate that this is composed of a five by five array of pixels. And each of those pixels has some value corresponding to its brightness value. Um, there are also ind indices here. So the upper left corner of this array is at index zero, zero. And if we go this way along the array, we see we're now at X coordinate five, still at Y coordinate zero. If we go down this way, we're at X coordinate zero and Y coordinate five, okay? So it's the y-axis for rasters is typically flipped from what you usually use in a Cartesian coordinate system, you know, just an xy plot, where zero, zero is usually the origin in the lower left corner. The raster, it's flipped, and that's, there's historical roots for that based on how raster images were created back in the 1950s and 1960s. That's still how we do it. Okay, um, so common properties of any raster or any grid, um, we have rows and columns. So rows are the, the things that move down in the y direction, columns in the x direction. Um, they are sometimes called lines and samples. Um, so it's just a 2D array. Every value has a data type. So this could be an 8-bit number. So some value from 0 to 255 could be a float 32 value, so a 4-bit value. Um, I won't get into too much there, but you may encounter this D-type um, attribute at some point. Um, usually there's some kind of information about the resolution and this could be dots per inch. You've probably seen DPI before, whether you're printing something or screen resolution. Um, so that's just kind of generic. Any raster grid is gonna have these properties. So really the difference is that now we're taking this information, we're adding more attributes so we can take that grid and put it in the world, okay? So continuous rasters, satellite imagery, digital elevation models, can it be heights derived from LIDAR? So these are situations where you can, it's kind of a linear scale of the values. So in this case, this one's showing a digital surface model. So basically surface elevations at the top of the, the canopy of these trees. And we have some low values here that are about 300 meters. And then if we go up this way, we see that the values get higher. So we're now at something like 400 meters relative to some datum, let's say above sea level or something. Okay, so that's what we mean by continuous numeric variables. It's uh, elevation values above sea level, for example, and you could, they're continuous. Categorical raster um, is a case where we have different classes for the, the grid values, okay? So in this case, it could be like a land cover. How many people have worked with land use land cover data before? Okay, um, a common one, um, I'll just, on the fly here. Let's see if we can pull up a map really quickly. So a common one is this uh, NLCD data set. Um, so this is a uh, 
set of classes here. You can see this green stuff. Those are forests up here in the Pacific Northwest. And then we have grasslands, um, et cetera. So basically, we have these classes. And this is a raster data set where every pixel has one of these values. OK. So um, in this case, they've classified that digital elevation model, digital surface model in the first uh, example with three classes, low, medium, or high elevation. Just an example. I don't know how useful this actually would be in the real world. OK, um, there's a lot of information here, but I, I'm going to kind of keep moving. Uh, rasters can be very efficient to represent um, continuous surfaces, and they can have very high level of detail. Um, but you can have very large file sizes. And you wouldn't want to grid the entire planet at half meter resolution and store it in one file. Right, that would be an enormous data set. Even if you only had sparse data, it still has to store the entire raster. And there's more complex ways to do that that could be more efficient, but um, we're not going to get into that here. OK, so to summarize so far, a raster is just a, a grid of values um, in image space, so local pixel coordinates, until we tell it where to go. So the way we do that is with a coordinate reference system. Sometimes this is a spatial reference system, um, but you'll often see this abbreviated as CRS. So basically, this tells you or tells the whatever is using the raster data what the datum. So that's, let's say, sea level uh, uh, relative to some shape model of the Earth. It tells us the projection. So maybe it's in UTM or long projection, geographic projection. You've probably encountered some of these. I mean, anything else we need to know to take that two-dimensional array and put it some in the world uh, so we could do something with it. So here are a couple examples of different projections and different coordinate systems. Um, this is a web mercator projection. This is, and there's these EPSG codes, which I think we'll talk about a little later. This is just a convenient way to reference a particular coordinate system. So we can use it and many applications can recognize what this is. So we have a couple others. This is UTM zone 11 north. So you can see there's a bit of distortion out here as we get farther from the central meridian of the projection, which is, happens to be, uh, I guess it's probably in here somewhere. Um, and then this is the kind of, you probably encountered these WGS84, which is a standard latitude and longitude grid for the planet. Um, and this common EPSG code is 4326. A lot of specific information there. Don't worry too much if this is new, but basically it's just saying there's multiple ways of representing this raster grid um, and storing it in projected coordinates. And the way we go back and forth between the image coordinates and the projected coordinates is using something called a, a geotransform. And this is essentially just a matrix where we take our original X and Y pixel values. So say it's the upper left corner of our grid which had zero, zero. And we have some affine transformation where we take that zero, zero, we multiply it by some coefficients, and we get the projected coordinates. So how, where that is in the world, and whatever projection we're using. So we'll show some examples of that in a bit. Um, but that's, that's kind of the two fundamental pieces there, this coordinate system reference, and then some transformation to go between the pixels in the image data to the pixels in the world. OK. Um, and a couple other key pieces. There's often this extent or a bounding box. Essentially, this is the extent of the raster in the real world coordinate system. Um, and then the resolution. So both of these are contained within this geotransformation. Uh, the resolution, you've probably all you know, dealt with this at some point. It's basically how big the pixel is when it's in the world coordinate system. OK, um, and here's a couple examples uh, of different resolutions for some remote sensing data where you can see pixels here. Each of these pixels covers 8 meters by 8 meters on the ground. And now we're going a factor of 2, factor of 2 high resolution. You can see we're able to resolve feed more features on the ground, um, including roads, et cetera. So this is going to be an important component for some of the machine learning applications we're dealing with, because the classifier will behave differently when handed this versus something like this. So something to pay attention to. But it also takes, you have to store all of those pixels. So there's trade-offs here. Um, OK, 
Uh, I'm just going to keep moving. If people have questions, please stop me and we'll, we'll get into some stuff. But um, why don't I get to Scott so he can show you the, the cool tricks you're going to need. Um, okay, so what we've been talking about so far is just a single band raster. So we've got one grid to represent values. Uh, often you're going to deal with multi band raster data. So this could be a red, green, blue image, RGB image, or maybe a Landsat data set which has many additional bands at different parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. Okay, so we have blue, green, red, near infrared out here, and then we get out into the shortwave infrared, and out in, even into the thermal infrared. So you're imaging the same spot on the ground through a different set of filters in the sensor, um, and you can extract different information. And often a lot of the, the classification and machine learning algorithms that we're using these days, they can leverage all of this information um, from these different wavelengths to do a better job figuring out what that pixel on the ground, uh, how to classify that or what to do with it. Okay, so the most common thing you've probably dealt with when you're crawling around um, looking at base maps in Google Earth or something like that, you're looking at a three band image. So it's a composite of red, green, and blue. Each of them has the same extent, the same dimensions, to the same bit depth, etc. And the viewer you're using can combine those to give you a composite image that our eyes can interpret um, the way we are used to seeing the world. Okay, cool. So that's, that's level zero. Let's go to level one. Um, so if we open up the next notebook here, this is gonna get into some of the, the nuts and bolts of how to actually work with rasters. Um, again, we could spend a week talking about any of this material, but we're going to do it in five minutes. So even though it says 15. Okay, so how do we store these rasters? There's a lot of different ways, and you may have encountered many of these. If we go to um, this GDAL data set, there's a list of maybe a hundred different rasters, or more than that at this point. Um, there are lots of ways you can store these grids and these arrays. Um, we're going to talk about a few of the most common ones, and really we're just going to talk about this GeoTIFF. Um, so, yeah, as we mentioned before, each of these things has this GeoTransform, this coordinate reference system, and often will tell you if there's some value that should be, um, shouldn't be worked with or should be ignored. So most of the things you're probably going to encounter out there in terms of rasters are going to be in this GeoTIFF file format. So it'll have this .tiff. Um, basically, it's a standard TIFF file. This is a this is a standard image protocol for storing raster data, but it has a header. So the first part of the file is actually a set of information. So it's metadata that's crammed into the file, and then the bits come that contain the actual image. Um, and there are lots of tools out there that can read this and know how to pull out that information and then do something with the, the actual image pixel data. So if you've taken a digital camera image um, and you've ever opened it up, it has a lot of information in this EXIF data. So it's essentially a bunch of metadata in the file. Um, the GeoTIFF can also have this, but it has that spatial information. Okay, and when you open up a GeoTIFF in something like QGIS or ArcMap or any of the tools we're gonna to talk about, it knows how to open and interpret that metadata and it makes it much more useful. Okay. Uh, and I'm going to skip through this stuff because some of the details. So, GDAL. Who's ever heard of GDAL? Who, who loves GDAL? <laughs> okay, who's ever had a, a real problem with GDAL at some point? Either compiling it or, yeah. yeah. It's, it's a wonderful tool, but it, is, it also has some caveats. So, um, we're going to use it peripherally, but I just want to quickly talk about a few things um, so you're at least aware of these. So it, GDAL is both a library and a set of command line tools. Um, so basically, it started out just being able to read, write, and transform data sets from one format to the other, right? So this, this long list of things, these are all different formats that GDAL can recognize, read, and turn into another format. So you can read in some obscure raster format, turn it into GeoTIFF, and, and move on. Um, it's, all, it's written in C++ primarily, um, so it's fast, very good at working with large images. Um, 
And there's these APIs for the languages we use, like Python, R, et cetera. Um, so one thing to mention, there, there are a suite, and that link is broken. Um, let's see about this one. Also broken. Oh, yeah. They, they recently updated the docu documentation, which is great. OK, so there is a list here of raster programs. Um, and I should mention, GDAL can also work with vector data. So there's this OGR package, which is kind of combined with GDAL, but we're not going to talk about that right now. So this is a set of utilities that you can call from the command line. GDAL info, GDAL translate, GDAL warp. These are the ones that you're going to want to pay attention to and learn. Um, it allows you to quickly take a raster geospatial data and look at it, inspect it, glean some information, maybe transform it, and um, do something useful with it. So the ones I'd recommend, GDAL info, translate, and warp, start with these three. Um, learn them. They will become tools. It's a Swiss Army knife, essentially. They will become tools you'll use for one-off things, or maybe batch processing. And I'll just put these in. If, if you're new to this, this is going to seem even more obscure. But if you've been using GDAL for a while, these are just a few tips. Whenever you're creating files, always tile them, compress them, and this big tiff of safe entry. Um, that allows you to store huge images, bigger than four gigabytes. Um, and just another note, uh, the default resampling algorithm is nearest neighbor. This is really fast, but you can end up with artifacts if you're not careful. So I just recommend using bilinear or bicubic when you're warping data sets from one to the other. And again, if that doesn't make sense, then don't worry about it. We can talk about it later or you know, come ask me and I'll explain a little bit more. Okay. Cool. So let's uh, let's play with some of this. So in Jupyter Hub, I think we probably covered this yesterday. Where you can put this exclamation point in front of a command, and it will run something as a, a shell in the shell. So if we do this, you should all have GDAL version 2.41, and this was a release from earlier this year. Okay. So one of the things we can do here, let's just quickly check, and I'm going to get rid of this for now. If we do this, we can see all the different formats that our version of GDAL can read and write. So this is from that list that I was showing on the web page. Our particular um, distribution of GDAL has all of these drivers built into it. So somewhere in here is the GeoTIFF driver. Okay, so that's that's big, but let's make it go away. Okay, um, so one of the cool things, GDAL, if you have an image sitting on your hard drive, you can work with it here. So you could do GDAL info image.tiff and it would tell you a bunch of information. In this case, since we're working in the cloud, um, we're going to grab an image that's stored on Amazon AWS S3. So this is living in the cloud. This is a Landsat 8 image. And if we come all the way over here, it should be a TIFF file. Yeah, so we're going to grab band 4. It's stored as a GeoTIFF. There's a lot of numbers in here. Don't worry about it. Basically, we could grab this and store it locally, and it would just be lco8.tiff on our, our hard disk. Instead, we're just going to grab it from the cloud. Okay, so we define these variables and we're going to now run GDAL info, giving it that input image. And again, don't worry about all this the, the VSI curl thing. Essentially, it's going to query this and it's going to grab information about this file that's stored in the cloud. And now we have a bunch of useful stuff. Okay, so skip through all the URLs we see that the raster size has 7,821, uh, that should be columns, by 7,951 rows. So it's more or less square. Um, we see that it, here's the coordinate system information. So this one's projected UTM zone 11 north. There's a lot of additional information here to tell us how to interpret this. So we have a datum, et cetera. Um, don't get bogged down with that information. This is really the primary um, thing that you need to know here. This is a transverse indicator, et cetera. Okay, and down here, this is that EPSG code. So this is the, there's a bunch of them in here. These to help to define the different portions of the coordinate system. But this is the primary EPSG code for this projection. So if we do, we just look at that really quickly, we'll see that there's a record for that, and that's our UTM 11 north. Okay. So that helps define our projection. This is a common system um, that most of these tools can use. 
here we have the coordinates in that UTM coordinate system. So these are meters it, relative to that UTM 11 North um, coordinate system. So we're, we see we're 204 kilometers in the X direction and 4.2 million in the Y direction from the equator, uh, the zero zero in that UTM coordinate system. That's where the upper left pixel of our raster is located. And we see that every pixel in our raster has uh, dimensions of 30 meters by 30 meters. Okay, so now we're no longer in our, our pixel dimensions here, the number of rows and columns in our array. Now we've got some information to take that array. We put it, the, up, the first upper left pixel goes here, and then every pixel is 30 by 30 from that grid. Okay, and GDAL will actually compute some of that for us. It'll give us the extent. This gives us the bounding box, and we, it also will give you the lat long coordinates. So we have our UTM projected coordinate system, lat long coordinates. Um, and there's some other information here. We see the data type is 16 bit integers, et cetera. Okay, that was a lot of detail. So one of the things we can do with GDAL Translate is we can turn that TIFF file into a different format. And we don't have time to get into all this. This VRT is kind of a wrapper. It's a convenient format. Um, yeah, it's kind of an advanced concept, so we're just gonna skip over that for now. Um, yeah, great. So reprojection. One of the things we commonly do with GDAL is um, take some projected data set. So the, what we just saw with UTM 11 North, say we wanna warp that into a different coordinate system or we wanna crop it or we wanna change the resolution from 30 meters to 90 meters or something like that. So GDAL warp provides a really nice utility to do that. So in this case, what we can do is run this GDAL warp command. We're gonna to convert to this coordinate system, which is lat long, this is a geographic coordinate system. We're gonna convert our original image to some output format that's lat long. Okay, and it'll give you a little progress bar saying done here. And then if we do a quick GDAL info on that output file, we see that our coordinate system has changed as have our image dimensions. And that's because that UTM grid was square and now we've put it in another coordinate system where it's kind of extended a little bit in the X direction, squished a little bit in the Y direction based on this geographic coordinate system. So this is again that 4326. When we look at these values now, we see the origin, now we're in decimal degrees. So this is latitude and longitude. And the pixel size is some tiny fraction of a degree of longitude and a degree of latitude. Okay? Generally, when working with rasters, it's there there are times when you would want to work with a raster in these coord in a lat long coordinate system. So you've got a global data set, some climate model output or something. But when working with a lot of remote sensing data, UTM is usually a pretty good choice, okay? Because the pixels have the same dimensions. It's a 30 by 30 pixel. Whereas the dimensions for this grid, if you're at the equator, the dimensions of a pixel are different than they are at the pole. And so there, there's trade-offs there. But again, we, we don't have time to get into all the cartographic uh, pros and cons of these things, so cool. Okay. Uh, I think we'll skip this tiling stuff. Um, there's this concept of overviews, pyramidal overviews. Maybe you've seen that window pop up in ArcMap or something like that. Basically, there's you've got a very, if you have a very high resolution raster, you can create smaller versions of it, and then when you zoom out when you're viewing it, it will load the smaller version. It's much faster to load and render that than it is to render this very high res resolution product. So anytime you're in Google Maps or any other web mapping service, you may see something about tiles and different tile zoom levels. Usually there's, they go from like zero to 18. Um, basically those are different resolutions of the same input data. So when you zoom all the way out to Google Maps, it's paging in the higher level overviews. It's not rendering the very detailed tiles that are down below. When you zoom in, it knows intelligently to pull those things. I think Scott may talk a little bit more about that today. Okay, let's continue our whirlwind and we'll quickly do some, talk about NumPy and Rasterio and then I will stop talking. So, um, 
Who's used NumPy? Who loves NumPy? It's great. It really is. I'm not even going to ask if people don't like NumPy. Because why would you? So um, NumPy is a great array manipulation toolkit in Python. All right. It takes the power of C++ and allows you to very easily work with arrays of data. And it handles all the different data types. Um, and there's a, a number of convenience functions. So you want to take the mean of an array or you want to slice and pull out pieces. It's, it's very intelligent, convenient ways to do that, and it's fast. Okay? So, as we mentioned before, a raster is just a 2D array of values, and a multiband raster, say that RGB image, is essentially a 3D array. So we have three identical two-dimensional arrays, the red, green, and blue. Okay, and NumPy can handle all these formats um, natively. Okay, so um, I'll just show a few examples here, and there's great resources and tutorials out there for NumPy. I recommend you dive into it a little more. Um, we're just gonna show some quick examples. So um, in this case, we're gonna create an artificial uh, gridded data set. And this looks complicated. Essentially what we're gonna do is assign values based on some function. And if we do that, um, this is gonna have 60 columns and 60 rows. So that's, those are the dimensions of our raster. And this is gonna give us our final values. So we could have just randomly assigned values, but we wanna do this some function here. Okay, so if we look at that array, we see now we have this NumPy array object, and it looks like you know, we've got these things, these brackets. So what this is showing, this is the first row of the array and then we close that bracket. That's the end of the first row. And in that row, we have these values. In this case, they're floating point values. Um, and this, this one is 0 0.02. We go to the next one, it's a little bigger, okay? If we go down to the next row, we see that the values have also changed. And then this format is also stored, so these are our columns here. So you can, th this is just the text representation. The simple way to look at this is to actually plot it as an image. And all of a sudden, if we come down here, we see, okay, our, the value we we're just looking at up there is 0 0.02, um, just somewhere in here on our color ramp. But this shows these, these function, the Z values that we pulled out for our array that had dimensions 48 by 64. Okay, so this is a raster. We're storing some value. It's a continuous um, set of values. So one of the things NumPy is good at is indexing. So say we wanted to pull out a single value, um, single value at col or, sorry, row 25 and column 20. We can do that. So we see the value of six, and that's probably somewhere in here. Yeah, so maybe somewhere around six. Um, we can also pull out sections of an array. So in this case, we're pulling out three values. And uh, we don't have time to get into this kind of syntax, but uh, there's good doc NumPy documentation on how to do this kind of thing. Say you want to pull out the first row or a chunk of the image. Um, but this is where the real power lies, is you can say, I just want the mean value of this array, and it will give you, it will compute that for you. Or you could say the standard deviation is this. And there's a whole host of functions out there um, I really encourage you to explore it. It's really powerful. Once you use GDAL to read in your raster, you've got this array of values. This is what you can use to actually do math and actually extract some information about it or multiply by five or compute some band ratio, which Scott will talk about. Okay, so uh, another one of the tools we, it, that we commonly use um, is Rasterio. This wraps GDAL and it's a more Pythonic interface to some of the more complex aspects of the GDAL API. Um, and I think we may not want to get into that. Scott, are you going to talk about this? Are you going to talk about Rasterio? Or should we just get this stuff? Yeah, I think we're running low. We're running. Uh, the point is, you can basically save files so we can take that array we just created. And do that first. We can write it out to a file. So we just created this example.tiff. 
And then we can open that file as if it had been stored or like the thing we loaded from the cloud earlier. And we can load it and plot it. And there's all this information, like what we saw in the GDAL info output. So we learned about the data type, the width, the height, the number of bands. This is the coordinate system. And then we have that geotransform, the thing that allows us to take these image pixels and put them into the world. Okay. And yeah, I think let's skip this in the interest of time and let's just keep moving on. Um, there's a lot more here. These are really powerful tools. Um, hopefully that gives you a brief overview of the kind of ecosystem and happy to talk more. Um, but I think we should just let Scott continue and hopefully things will become more clear. Okay, um, maybe we'll just take a minute to get you guys doing something. There's a lot of like heavy kind of theory and showing in that first section of uh, the raster tutorial, but it's good to get everyone kind of up to speed and on the same page. So we've got a little Google Doc um, following off what Ben did yesterday. If you go to, um, I'm gonna post this on the Slack channel. There's just a short link to uh, document we put together. Um, the idea here is kind of a quick, quick survey to see now, um, well, now you've seen some of these tools, but just curious like what software people do use when they work with raster data. So there's a couple questions about surrounding that. Also, what kind of, uh, if you're interested in data from a particular satellite or aircraft, uh, what data formats you typically encounter. Um, and then the last question is actually kind of more for us, which you can fill out after we're done with this tutorial. We've got about an hour left to go over some other things, but like, you know, points of confusion or things that um, you wish you knew a little bit more about. So, uh, this will be nice. We'll look at this and we can modify the material based on kind of the feedback we're seeing. But already I'm noticing, yeah, people are interested in many different satellites um, using Python for many things. Some of these libraries we didn't talk about, raster stats, we're probably not going to get to. There's a lot of stuff out there. So this is a whirlwind. But thanks for just contributing to that document. That'll be helpful. And this uh, next series of notebooks is kind of a, a mashup of visualization tools. We will show a bit of vector related things um, and we wanted to showcase uh, some different data sets, particular data sets. So you notice in the names of these notebooks, three, four, five, six, we have MODIS, Landsat 8, Sentinel-2, Digital Globe. Um, I think these are sensors that people often work with. Uh, so we've showcased a few things related to those specific sensors. And um, this next bit will be a bit more interactive. So just gonna, you can revisit that Google, Google Doc um, but let's keep going. So we got about 50 minutes left in the tutorial with uh, notebook three, which is visualization and modus data. Um, so Friedrich uh, wanted us this year to focus on uh, maybe a common theme throughout these tutorials. And since we were doing the um, OpenStreetMap project to, to kick off the hack week, we kind of just picked one of the previous uh, mapping projects through humanitarian open street map as a way to like unify the raster vector vector and machine learning tutorials and so we wanted a common kind of area of interest a common bounding box to work with so this next series of notebooks is a bit more practical in the sense that okay i have a bounding box of interest how do i get raster imagery over that area of interest and and how do i visualize it and work with it so modus um how many folks have worked with the MODIS instrument? Show of hands in the room, a couple. I would say, 
don't know, maybe a quarter of the people in the room. It's a, it's a neat instrument. Um, there are actually two. Uh, they're on NASA's Terra and Aqua satellites. And this is a moderate resolution raster instrument. So you can see in this opening paragraph um, that we're going to be working with raster data here that has a 250 meter pixel resolution or pixel posting. So this is not sufficient for looking at building footprints, for example, but uh, gives you a nice like big picture. Uh, or if you're interested in larger areas, looking at maybe large swaths of forest, maybe this is an instrument that could serve your purposes. So we'll showcase um, some quick visualizations here using MODIS data um, with a library called IPy Leaflet. So this is also going to showcase some more neat things you can do with Jupyter Notebooks. We saw some example widgets yesterday. Um, and these are really powerful, as you'll see, you can start working with raster data without going to separate websites, and you can kind of do this synthesized workflow all within a, the Jupyter Lab. So as I just mentioned, we're going to work with a common bounding box. Um, this bounding box is chosen, if we scroll back up here to the top, you can go to click on these links for the OpenStreetMap websites. But um, this particular event was uh, the open street map mapping event was triggered by Cyclone Kenneth um, in April of this year. So uh, you can go ahead and read more about that on the website, but we're focusing in here on a bounding box that covers the capital city of Moroni and the union of the Comoros Islands in the Indian Ocean. And so often what happens is someone gives you a name like that and you're not quite sure where that is. I, to be honest, would not have been able to put that on the map if someone asked me. Um, so these tools are very helpful for kind of getting a big picture of where you're working, I think. So Leaflet is a library that allows you to display maps in a browser. I'm gonna zoom out a little bit here. Everyone can see that pretty well. So this is our bounding box that we've displayed on an interactive map. Um, the background base map is using actually OpenStreetMap data that we're now familiar with. So these are interactive maps and you can zoom in and as you zoom in, uh, the base map updates with resolution. Um, so this is a very powerful way to kind of get familiar with whatever area of interest you're working in. So next we're going to bring some MODIS data into the mix and um, NASA has this great service called Gibbs, which is the Global Imagery Browse Service. And what they've done is they've pre-tiled a lot of imagery from various sensors, including MODIS. And so David briefly mentioned raster tiles, but what this does is basically pre-form um, these RGB images and then tile them for convenient visualization. So for something like MODIS, um, you get the raw band data and RGB. And in the past, it's been up to a user to download each band and create your own RGB composite. But with these sort of tiling services, uh, uh, one of the NASA DACs has done this for you, the archive centers, and then you can visualize these tiles quite easily. So if you'll notice in this code, it's not that different except that we're identifying a new base map, which is NASA Gibbs MODIS uh, True Color and we specify a date for that image. MODIS generally gets a daily image everywhere on the globe. And this is often the case, you sacrifice resolution for frequency. So you get um, you know, coarse resolution images from MODIS, but they're for your area of interest daily, which is, which is nice. Let's plot this. So this is pretty cool. You can also add some different widgets and features into these leaflet maps. In this case, we're using a, a slider, which shows you the open street map data on the left, and then this MODIS image on the right. And there's the cyclone, right? So you can quickly kind of get big picture visualizations of what's happening with this raster data. Um, I believe this should update in resolution as well as you zoom in on this image. It's a little hard to tell because it's all white <laughs> clouds here. But the idea is that these are tiles. And so as you zoom in, you get a higher resolution. Oh, 
rendering of the MODIS data set. Um, and then I'll just show one other feature with these leaflet maps. Uh, uh oh, it's not working. They're displaying widget. That's not good. Um, we'll revisit this. <laughs> but you can include and tie together widgets. So for example, we just picked a date uh, in April, but you can add a date selection widget as well. It allows you to change the date. Um, and then you can pan through these things and quickly visualize MODIS data over an area. So yeah, we just wanted to show that to get um, people familiar with this bounding box area of interest. If you wanted to work with a specific band of MODIS data, right now there is some MODIS data stored on AWS that you can go look at. Uh, I'd also encourage people to use NASA's Earth Data Search tool. So how many folks have used this tool, Earth Data Search? They've tried to, NASA's in the process of trying to consolidate their archives. And so this is kind of the go-to web interface for searching for all of the archives and downloading individual data sets. OK, so let's go ahead and work with Landsat 8, which is a higher resolution uh, instrument. We're going to look at loading data from the Landsat 8 satellite over the same bounding box. Landsat 8 um, it is a multi-spectral imager. So we have bands of various resolution. So in this library, or this notebook, we're going to import a lot of libraries at the beginning. And I'm not going to go over them in detail right now. Um, but you will see throughout the notebook, if you see, um, for example, PD dot read file, that's the pandas library. So you can come up here and kind of reference like where these functions are coming from. Uh, but we're using a lot of different libraries in order to uh, work with this raster data. So the bounding box is the same as what we just looked at before. And now to get to Landsat data, we're going to use a tool called Sat Search. Um, we're going to use Landsat data on Amazon Web Services, partly because we're running our hub here and these notebooks are on Amazon. So it makes sense to run your computation wherever the data sets are stored. And um, let's just go through a few. Uh -oh. Yeah, not sure what that error was due to. So the SAT search library is searching the Landsat archives stored on AWS based on a bounding box and date range. Um, it's using something called stack catalogs, which is a metadata catalog kind of tailored towards searching. And most often, you want to search for raster data based on a bounding box and date span. I would say that is like the number one thing that people go to are using those two filters to find data on their area of interest. And so it's a kind of a simplified supplemental metadata format to accompany these catalogs on the cloud. And we've just searched based on that bounding box and date time. And we've, we've found what's been returned from our search are actually two collections of data, the Sentinel-2 uh, data and Landsat-8. Um, you can look through these items that are returned from the search to get more information. So in this case, we're going to look at the Landsat-8 uh, second collection. And you can kind of you see information about where this data is coming from, the provider, uh, Planet Labs, has, or Planet has um, provided this data set on AWS. And we can also get information about the bands from the Landsat instrument. So that's what we're printing here. OK, so let's actually get another search going. And then we're going to sort 
this search of land, uh, for Landsat scenes by um, the earliest scene first. And so over this bounding box over the Comoros, we found 300 Landsat scenes. We can save these scenes. Um, and we can use pandas, which we'll talk about a little bit more in the, in the vector tutorial, but also maybe a show of hands, how many folks have used pandas before in Python? Great, most folks. Very common for visualizing and working with tabular data sets. So in this case, you know, we have this information up here that's in a Python dictionary. It's very hard to read, um, but these pandas data frames are a nice visual expression often of like Python dictionaries. So here we're seeing uh, the bands of Landsat and their names. Band one is coastal, uh, band two blue, green, red, near infrared, etc. So that search we can also put into a pandas, geo pandas data frame, geo data frame. And that just is a standard pandas data frame, except you add a geometry column, which represents some sort of vector geometry. So with images, we're often looking at image footprints on the ground. We want to know the polygon that a raster image, um, uh, that bounds a raster image. And similarly, we can print out kind of like nicely formatted information about each band. You see here the center wavelength for each band window and also ground sample in ground sample distance or the pixel posting resolution for each of these band Landsat bands. Um, so most of these are 30 meter ground sample distances in these bands. You do have some, a panchromatic band, for example, that is a higher resolution, 15 meter pixel. Um, so we can also do other search filters based on common metadata filters. So in, in this case, here's a quick example of sorting um, and removing scenes that have a lot of cloud cover. So there's kind of an automatic first pass filter to just get scenes that don't have a lot of cloud cover in them. So we've gone from 300 to 132 here. Um, but we want to emphasize kind of some tools to visualize, because just as David was showing with the uh, NumPy arrays, which underlie all of these raster data sets, um, visualization is kind of the way to go with raster data. You can't absorb all these printouts of, of uh, numerical data. So we're going to introduce a new library here um, called HVPlot, which is part of this suite of tools uh, referred to as Holoviz in Python. And these are, these are plotting tools focused on browser visualization. So this will come up for rec vector data and raster data. And for this visualization, we're going to plot um, this geo data frame that we created up above that has all these image footprints. So we can see here Landsat 8, eight data around our bounding box. Um, and each of these frames is an individual raster image footprint. <clears throat> and another common way to visualize and work with raster data is to visualize the thumbnails of, of uh, these raster images. So thumbnails are low resolution kind of pre-rendered images. The footprints, is, they're great for making sure you're getting data that covers your area of interest, but you also might want to flip through to get a sense of the data quality. So here we're looking for um, just browsing through the thumbnails of these Landsat scenes, again, using these uh, uh, JupyterLab widgets. So you can click on the slider and move through these images. I want to show you guys a really cool feature that I use a lot with JupyterLab. If you click on an output cell like this, right click, you get a list of options. You can use this uh, create new view for output and it pops up a separate window. So you can create things like this thumbnail browser. And <clears throat> as you keep going through your notebook, that stays off to the right. So we're going to now, let's say we want to browse through these thumbnails. Yeah, uh, let me just close it. So we created this little thumbnail viewer. You can right click and select create new view for output. 
and that pops up. Oh, that didn't work the second time. Interesting. <laughs> uh, let me just recreate this. Yeah, so you've created an output in your main notebook. Right click on it, create new view for output, and you, you get a separate tab that you can move around, kind of start to customize your, um, your working space. So that's useful because you kind of, these notebooks are very linear in many senses. You want to keep running these cells from top to bottom and keep going. So we want next want to identify based on these thumbnails, a specific scene to open the red band from. Um, you can continue to interact with this kind of viewer on the right and select like a Landsat ID that you want to work with later in your notebook and keep going back and forth. So, so far we've really emphasized kind of these visualizations of the low resolution tools or the footprints and now we'll demonstrate how to open the full resolution file um, and work with some more analytical workflows. We're going to use the Rasterio library that David introduced and um, there are a few lines in here to kind of efficiently work with this data set that's sitting on web storage. So this is just a configuration setting that we don't have to worry too much about. And this next uh, cell is pretty important. So we'll spend a minute or two looking at it. <clears throat> so I'm just picking um, the first item from our search, which is gonna be the uh, uh, earliest date back from 2013, I believe. Uh, and we can select the actual URL for that uh, image. So we saw earlier working with GDAL, you can kind of point to an image that's sitting on a web server like this and, and get information and open it. Um, the Raster, Rasterio library allows you to open these files into Python and basically return a NumPy array with the data in addition to the metadata. So when we use this Rasterio library and open the URL, uh, we get this object back that contains the image metadata. So that's what we're printing in this line. Um, and we can also reference all the features of this raster data set. So the width, for example, the block size is something we haven't really talked about, um, but this is how the image is kind of pre-chunked into blocks. So you don't store the array as one flat array of bytes, but you, you identify chunks of the image. You basically break it up into small chunks. Um, so you can look at the metadata and it'll typically report uh, for example, here we see block size being reported as 512 for this data. If you don't report it, it will still open the file. It will just assign some sort of default block size. So um, I'm bringing this stuff up because it sounded like folks were quite interested in using X-Ray and Dask to work with large sets of imagery. And so I'll just step back a minute and say big picture what we're going for with opening these files with Rastreo and X-Ray is to um, open them, but identify what the kind of blocks are so that we can efficiently do distributed computing with these arrays with Dask. So that's kind of the direction we're Yes, question. Um, sure. So let me step through a few things to answer that question first. So we've opened the, once again, I'll just open the URL with this Rasterio library that gives us some metadata about the image. Then um, we can put that opened image from Rasterio into this X-Array library, which gives us what's called a data array. So that's what we're printing out below here, what Rob is asking about. 
this is sort of the Python object. So beyond just a NumPy array, which was this um, 2D set of values, uh, we now have metadata associated with the raster and information about the coordinates and the coordinate reference system. So think of it as kind of a pandas equivalent um, where you're not only moving your data around, but also keeping a record of the metadata. So here in this data array, we see again the y and x dimensions, that's our NumPy array, but we also have a single band that we've opened. So from above, again, we can see that we opened the red band for this particular Landsat date. Um, the date, we just haven't appended as metadata, but we could add it uh, to keep track of the date. Rob was asking, why doesn't the date show up? Um, it, the date is contained in the file name, but it's not part of the open raster.io function that parses that date out and stores it. It's sort of on you to keep track of the date, if that makes sense. And later I'll show how you can do that. So what happened here, again, worth, it's worth noting that we haven't actually opened any of the numerical values. We've just opened metadata that points to this object stored on, in this case, S, S3, which is the Amazon uh, space for serving files. But when we want to visualize or compute anything with these data sets, then we actually have to pull the data um, from that location. And so this next, this next step here is making a plot, which is pulling information, in this case, 7,000 by 7,000 pixels, approximately an integer type, and sending all that uh, data into our browser to visualize. So I'm gonna zoom out again, so that fits. And also a helpful little thing there, if you type data, uh, you'll see a visualization of data structure, um, which is super, super, super helpful and useful. Yeah. Uh, when you try to think about what the structure looks like. Uh, but not that. We can add a cell to, to do this, so da.data. Um, this is what Ben is talking about, which is pretty cool. So da, this is a Dask array under the surface. Um, when we open something into X-Array and specify what in, to X-Array and Dask are called chunks, but what Rasterio considers blocks, um, they're just a different name for the same thing, um, we get a Dask array back. And so this Dask array has this concept of there's this massive image that's 7,000 by 7,000 pixels, but we can often work with small subsets of that image at, for any given computation and distribute the computations we want to do with it. So um, this is showing a Dask array which has these chunk, size, chunk sizes built into it. So it's a nice visual representation of the data set we're working with. Um, here we're using the same Holovis uh, set of tools, this HV plot, to now look at a full resolution raster. So previously we just plotted the footprints. Now we've got our values for, in this case, the red band. Um, these are great visualization tools because you get uh, kind of an interactive view. You can report all the coordinates and values as you pan around. So if you're looking at, um, you know, the values um, as we move our cursor, uh, you can see the X and Y, which in this case are UTM coordinates and the value. This value is going to be uh, intensity return for the red band. So it's not necessarily a physical unit, but it's a measure of intensity for the red observation. You have these tools over on the right that give you some interactivity. So there's this magnifying glass um, to zoom in to certain sections. I think actually we'll go down here, which is where the island is, if I remember right. And as you zoom, um, the resolution updates on these images. So uh, again, it's sort of, these tools are smart about displaying like an appropriate amount of information given your zoom level. So here we see the outline of the island. Um, and this is 30 meter pixel data. Okay, 
Another nice aspect of these tools is you can easily do some on the fly reprojections. So if you don't want to work in the UTM coordinates that the image is stored in, you can reproject it to uh, a latitude and longitude coordinate system. You just have to tell the, the tool right now, the visualization doesn't pick up that coordinate reference data automatically. So we specify that this is UTM 38 north. And then we can, instead of plotting the original coordinates, we reproject to a latitude longitude reference. This is also helpful because often you've got vector data that's in a, for example, the latitude longitude, your raster data is in UTM, but you want to compare the two. And often you're often doing these games of converting uh, projections from to match, basically. So here we have our bounding box that was defined in latitude longitude that's overlaid on the same visualization. Uh, I believe you can specify it. In this case, we haven't. So it just shows up as zero. But yeah, the values over here. Um, often you have a lot of zeros with satellite imagery because it's taken as a swath and the Earth's rotating as you take the image and you uh, end up with a lot of zeros surrounding your image. Okay, so another common thing that's come up is uh, you don't want to work with this full 7,000 by 7,000 array. You're interested in just this bounding box right here, which covers the islands we're looking at that was affected by Cyclone Kenneth. So this comes up all the time. Most of the scene you're not interested in. Uh, and you spend a lot of time waiting currently to download this entire scene or you know, a whole time series set of these scenes. In reality, you only want to work with this small subset. So these tools, uh, Rasterio and X-Ray, are very helpful for extracting subsets of these files. But I should mention it's important to have the, the image in the appropriate format to begin with. So these are stored as TIFFs, um, which work well for subsetting. Uh, other file types right now don't necessarily allow you to do this efficiently. But for TIFFs, we can easily um, extract a subset based on some sort of shape file or bounding box. So this next cell here, again, we'll spend a little time looking at this because it's a pretty important um, set of code that I think people will find really useful for their projects. We're using the same machinery to open this URL, which again is only opening the metadata and not bringing in the pixel values. And we have a shape that was defined by our bounding box. So if we um, just look at that real quick, if you remember earlier on, we defined this bounding box and put it into a geodata frame. We do that pretty quickly. So um, we've done this whole series pretty quickly. So I, I do hope that a lot of these notebooks will just serve as good references for people because there's a lot to take in. But conceptually, I want to everyone to understand like this bit of code here is taking a polygon, our area of interest, and we're just, just going to get the raster pixel data that's within that polygon. So that's what's happening in this cell. We open the URL. Uh, we identify the shape we're going to use to extract the pixel values from that shape. And we have to put it into the same coordinate reference frame. So in this case, um, we're using the UTM coordinates of the image. And we use the raster.io library to extract this subset of the image. We can then use the same library to, to write a local file. So you want to keep a copy maybe, but just of that small subset of the image. And so that's what we did with the cell here. We wrote out subset.tip. And if you open that later, you'll see that it's just the section of the data over the area we're interested in, but at that full 30 meter resolution. So this is really powerful for if you want to work with large amounts of data, but want to hone in on a subset, um, this is how you can extract that data. OK. Uh, any, any questions? That was a lot of content, so 
I'm guessing there's a question or maybe people are just too overwhelmed to ask a question. <laughs> but yeah. Joe. I think it's worth mentioning that the structure you showed here, the quiz um, file as is not a very serious specific thing. It's a Pythonic way of opening a file. So people just get to kind of the context that quiz and whatever it is in there. Yeah. They can navigate here. So just so people are clear about this um, syntax here, if you're new to Python, what Scott's showing right here with, and then the file as a name, and then as and source, this is a, a very Pythonic way of opening files in general. And the nice thing about doing it that way that um, when you open the data set, then you execute the block. After the block is executed, it will close the file for you, which is a very important uh, thing to keep in mind once you open a lot of files and you don't close them, you will run a very big Python program that sometimes can crash your machine. So I highly recommend if you ever have a chance to use the syntax with as, that you do that, because it will just take care of you, take, to take care of that for you without you worrying about how many files you have opened, do I, will, will I crash my system, analyzing many, many human data. Yeah. Any other questions about raster data? Yeah. So uh, this is a hvplot uh, hv is a library that we imported at the very top when we're importing. We just, in these notebooks, put all the libraries we're using in that first cell. Yeah, that's a really good observation. So we don't, you see, we did not import Dask up here. Um, we do import X-Ray, uh, and X-Ray brings Dask with it currently. So it's, yeah, it's, yes, yeah. So that's happening behind the scenes. And that's very common. Often you'll import a library in Python. That library actually imports other libraries behind the scenes. So. Um, you don't necessarily see all the libraries that are being run. Yeah, so GFA was here, I, I, I glossed over this very quickly, but uh, we identified a bounding box. It's just simply based on the south, north, west, and east latitude and longitude. And um, this code here puts it into uh, a standard vector format called GeoJSON, this bounding box. You can then load um, files like that with GeoPandas, this library to work with vector data. And so GFA is just the polygon representation of our bounding box. Yeah, it is <clears throat> this blue box right here. You can see the outline. Yep, that blue box is the area of interest, which is basically the bounding box of the island we're focused in on. Cool. So we've got about 15 minutes left. And what I wanted to show, because yesterday this came up a fair amount, uh, there's one other question actually before. Yeah, I was just wondering if I had, so in our video, we noticed that on the island, there is a lot of the Yeah, so some, some images uh, come or have a cloud mask band that you can load in. And I can't remember if this Landsat data has that built into it or not. 
uh, but all I showed earlier was just the, the bulk scene had an estimate of 15%. So your islands could be cloud free. Chances are it's the part with the cloud, but um, it's always worth like looking in, looking at the data itself, I think. Okay. So yesterday, um, people were mentioning wanting to work with X-Array, wanting, hearing that it's a good library to work with in browser tools. Um, and part of the reason for that is that it integrates well with Dask, so you can work with large, start to work with large sets of data rather than this individual scene. Um, so I'll just spend the remaining 15 minutes talking about how that works in a bit more detail. Um, X-Array, uh, has this, I'm going to open their documentation page actually. Um, so this little image right here, <laughs> if we could zoom in, uh, or actually, hold on a sec. Yeah, that's what I was just thinking. Uh, okay, great. This is a great, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Make this bigger. Can people see this? Let me just zoom in on this. Great. Okay. This image is what I want people to look at. Um, this is a great just visual representation of, of what X-Ray is trying to do. So X-Ray is this Python library that's designed to work with multi-dimensional data. Um, so if you worked with NetCDF or HDF files, you often have more than one variable in the data set you're looking at. So with raster bands like Landsat that we just looked at, you could consider these bands of red, green, blue, different data variables. So here we see data variables of temperature and precipitation, um, but you could also conceptualize those as uh, near infrared um, or cirrus band. And then you have latitude, longitude for your coordinates and um, uh, dimensions of X and Y, which in this case for latitude, longitude. You can also have this dimension of time. Um, so you can start to conceptualize stacking many images from the near infrared through time. So this kind of introduces this concept of a data cube where you're no longer working with a 2D single image in time, but you're starting to work with data that's labeled in terms of its coordinates and dimensions, um, and it can be arbitrarily large, basically. Um, so that's, that's kind of the conceptualization of what X-Ray is. And let's, for example here, um, let's say we wanted to load all of the 30 meter bands. Say we wanna work with some band ratios, do a ratio of near infrared to red or any of these bands that have a common sampling footprint. Um, we've made a function here to load each of those bands. So as you can see, we're just looping over the bands uh, that we've identified above, load each of them into an X-ray object, but then bring them together into a larger data set. Uh, this cell should not be there. <laughs> so the Dask bit, don't run that. <laughs> If you did, don't worry about it. It'll it should still be fine. Um, so we'll run that function. And uh, it's maybe not the most efficient way of loading all of these things, but as you can see, it's pretty quick because again, we're just kind of reading the metadata on these files. And now if we print out DA, DA stands for data array. X-ray has this concept of data array, um, which is schematically what I just showed before but the data array only has one variable. In this case, we're storing bands as a dimension. And um, you can see in the coordinates here, Y is the UTM northing, X is the easting, and bands now, based on our function, we've identified that each band has its, has its label. So this is, this is also just really nice because now we can start to refer to um, working with the image by its labeled dimension. So you're no longer trying to remember, oh, was dimension one, zero, X, Y, or what's our band? Everything's labeled. Um, so we can plot an image here 
that's grouped by band. Uh, and this will take a minute because it's going to pull all of the data. <clears throat> and I'm going to close this browser and zoom out a bit. So what's neat, and this sometimes gets hidden based on how your browser's set up, is that uh, these HB plot tools, um, it recognizes that we're going to plot this X-ray data array that's grouped by the band. And it knows that there are eight bands in this data set. So we automatically get a widget that lets us select the band we're visualizing. And it may take a minute to update. Um, but the image should re-render. Yeah, it is a bit confusing. In this case, it's looking through the bands, just the way we've set up this data array. Um, I think I'll open, go through the next section because I think it is a better conceptual way to work with this stuff. But it, um, it is confusing whether you're referencing something as a data variable or a coordinate or a dimension. It's wild to wrap your head around. Uh, we've stored them as bands currently, which is a dimension and each coordinate value corresponds to a band. Um, let's look at a data set, and I think that will clarify the difference. So a data set stores things in terms of variables. So this next function, let's look at the way we've structured um, DS in this case. I think this is a more natural way to work with data like this. Instead of storing things in bands as a data array, the data set has this concept of separate variables. So we've identified here each, each variable now has the name corresponding to each band. Um, in this case, as Rob, you asked earlier, why isn't there a label for time? Um, we added, I added that explicitly in this function because I wanted to keep track of time. And uh, that is this line right here. We're adding a time dimension. So that's helpful if you want to start constructing a time series. Um, this is just a single data set. So again, it's not that big. Um, if you want to work with an individual variable from that data set, so if you want to just extract the blue band, we can do um, what we've been doing earlier with this HB plot syntax. Um, and this is kind of the way to extract the blue band from this data set. So again, I think X-ray is a really nice tool conceptually for working with rasters because the labels make sense. You know, if you are working with the blue band, it's not DS parentheses three, which doesn't necessarily convey which bands you're working with. Because things are labeled, the code is easier to read and it's um, uh, basically um, reduces the number of mistakes you make. <clears throat> so I'll also point out um, these are Dask arrays under the surface like we've seen before. They have a chunk size associated with them. And when you do computations on Dask arrays, sometimes it seems surprisingly fast. <laughs> so if we calculate NDVI, which is just a simple band ratio of near infrared and red, uh, you can see we got a Python object back immediately. Uh, that happens because the computation didn't actually happen. It's just a reference to the computation. And it doesn't, it doesn't happen until we s instruct Dask to actually run it. So you have to say compute if you want to actually generate all these values. Otherwise, it's just a reference to what will be done. Um, so here we can actually run the computation and get the values back. Okay, so finally I want to illustrate um, using a cluster, a Dask cluster. So now um, this last cell you can see we actually have an array that was returned 
with values in it. All right, so now finally we'll do an example that I think will be useful to get people started on their projects. Um, let's say we want to load five images. So now we're starting to work with a time series and not just a single image. So I'm just doing another search here to grab five images from August to September. This is the same kind of search syntax we've used before and, and putting those search results into a data frame. So you can see here the dates of the images we're working with. Or again, um, now we know how to plot the footprints of those images. So let's say we want to work with all of those images. This is a really common case of raster, working with raster data where your island is sitting there in between a bunch of images in the overlap zone of different dates and whatnot. So you want to work with all of this information, but you're only interested in this box again, this bounding box here. Um, so we're going to use the same function we had before to load, uh, load the data set, but for each of these image swaths up here into X-ray. <clears throat> that will take a minute. Um, go back. So if we print the size of this data set, uh, that seems surprisingly big, but uh, 100, 165 gigabytes now is the estimated size if we were to pull all of this data in, into our browser. Uh, why is that? Um, if we look at DS, so DS is now all of these data sets combined. One important thing to note is that all of these frames have the same coordinate reference system. They're all in the same UTM zone with the same origin. So we didn't have to do any fancy reprojection. But what we do have to do if we want to load these into a Python object is kind of expand our data set size. So original data set is about 7,000 by 7,000 pixels, which corresponds to one of these image footprints. As soon as we try and load more together, that data set size now becomes this entire bounding box, which contains all three of the footprints. So it's quite big, um, which is why we're seeing this ballooning and estimated size if we were to pull this data. But what's really powerful about X-Ray is it is smart enough to resize our data object to contain all of those images. So that's because each image has the coordinates associated with it, and it can do alignment based on the coordinates. This is something that you can't do if you just load these things into NumPy arrays, for example. Um, and that's pretty quick. And we didn't load those 165 gigabytes. But if we said ds.compute mean, we would. So we have to be careful about um, how we do distributed comp computations. It's not all entirely automatic. Um, and I'll illustrate how this can work with a Dask cluster. So right now, these Dask arrays are using all of the cores on the machine we're running with. Um, but what's really powerful about Dask is you can launch different types of clusters. So there is a button on the left-hand side here that looks like a little set of wings. And this is a thing called a Dask Lab extension. If you click the New button, you can uh, create a cluster with Dask. Um, if people could hold off doing this, <laughs> that'd be great. Um, but uh, let's just do, you can say adaptive scaling. Um, we want anywhere from two to 10 machines to run this computation. And hopefully that will go pretty quick. Yeah, there we go. So. Now in this cluster, you can see I've got two machines, uh, 14 gigabytes of, of 
RAM memory available to me right now. And I can inject this cluster into the notebook with these, this maybe non-intuitive uh, set of arrows here. And you, you get a cell in your notebook that basically pro provides access um, to that cluster. So Dask knows that there are these machines sitting there that you can utilize. You also get these nice buttons up above that give you uh, kind of printouts of what's happening on the cluster. So the number of workers and we'll also open a task stream to show what Dask is doing. So now Dask not only has this single machine we're running on, but it also is connected to these other machines. And this is very helpful if we start to work with um, large data sets. Yeah. Yeah, so the wings are sitting over here on the far left of this wow. JupyterLab interface. You can hit new um, and then select the number of machines you want to work with. So I would recommend uh, people stick to, let's say, a max of four machines just because we don't want to overwhelm everyone if people are doing this together. Um, so, so this cluster is now active. And this next bit of code is kind of the key thing. So we've got this massive data object that's up here with huge dimensions, time, number of bands, all our data variables in terms of, uh, I'll close this again, um, in terms of blue, cirrus, green, red, et cetera. This is what this thing looks like. But again, let's just say we only are interested in the island. So with X-Array, you can um, use the syntax of selection and specify the X coordinates we want to extract, um, the Y coordinates we want to extract. And then you can do computations that act on some dimension of the data set. So it's really important to hone in on the area of interest first, because that greatly reduces the pixels we're working with and then take a mean or do whatever computation you want to do. So what we're doing here is, is generating a mosaic over the island. We're taking a mean along uh, the band dimension. Um, again, you can see the chunk size up here. Uh, you can change these chunk sizes, which are the quantities of the array that each DASC computation is going to use. And so, um, if you want, you can change those. That's what the command there is doing. And then hopefully when this runs, you'll see um, this task stream down at the bottom. These are computations happening on this cluster. So Dask is now taking each chunk of that image that we want to work with, farming it out to one of those machines on the cluster, doing the computation, and then sending it back to us. Um, so that was it's pretty quick. It's kind of nice to have that visual cue to see that, oh, stuff's happening as well. Sometimes you run big computations with images and um, you're not sure. You're waiting, you're waiting. You don't know if it's going to crash or you're going to get the image back. So this kind of indicates that things are happening. And um, we're out of time. So this is a great place to end. It's kind of went through at a furious pace from what is a raster in pixels and now doing, being able to do distributed computations with rasters. But I think people will be interested in trying out some of this stuff for the project. So you can refer back to these notebooks and hope that helps.